I was thinking that it would start, I ask you questions and you answer yes or no. Were you the mastermind that cheated the Olympics? Yes. Today, the World Anti-Doping Agency suspended Russia's sports drug testing lab. 99% of Russian athletes are guilty of doping. It's worse than we thought. If this is true, it is an unimaginable level of criminality. I was helping to facilitate one of the most elaborate doping ploys in a sport history. This goes all the way back to 1968. Every sport was Putin aware of the existence of the Russian doping system? Yes. We are top level cheaters. This all can be proved. It's quite mind blowing. New York Times is breaking tomorrow. Tomorrow. It has the potential of affecting the credibility of all sport. Why would I watch an event that's fixed? Danger? Yes. Oh, I need to escape. Putin will kill me. Holy shit. Putin calls the claims the slander of a turncoat. Two people connected with the Russian doping program are already dead. There never was anti-doping in Russia, ever. Ura! Well, Gregory uh, told me a story that the reason he got the idea of swapping the urine essentially from the Chinese in Beijing. He was at Beijing, and according to him, what the Chinese did in Beijing, if you look in Beijing, the Chinese won 133 medals, yeah. right? They swept those Beijing yeah. Olympics. It was also they the won most— They won in swimming. It was also the most incredible Olympics anybody had ever seen, the opening ceremonies, the closing yeah. ceremonies. I mean, it was the Swiss watch of Olympics, yeah. and it was China showing the world— that they were a world superpower. It was yeah. China's coming out party to planet Earth and going, hey, if we can do this, we can build your cars, we can build your watches, we can make your clothes. If there's any doubt whether or not that China is a power, look what we did in these Olympics. And according to Gregory, what the Chinese did just wasn't as sophisticated as the Russians. What the Chinese did is that the Chinese athletes would report to the doping control officers when they came in to test, mm -hmm. but that there were certain agents that were basically Chinese government agents, right? And the athlete would know which of those agents to report to. And they would report to those agents, and the doping control officers that were watching them pee would have a little bag of urine, give it to the athlete to put under their armpit, mm -hmm. and so the athlete would, would uh, test clean, yeah. would, would pee clean, and that's why there was no positives for Chinese athletes uh, out of Beijing. And if they go back to test those samples out of Beijing, they'll find a ton of positives from other athletes, but they're not going to find positives from the Chinese. Wow. That's old school, by the way. The thing under that was yeah. like when we came into cycling, there was always talk about, you know, the 70s and 80s, all these things they would, you know, they'd have a bladder slipped, you know, somewhere to, you know, just then you had the urinate. Remember the urinator? That that NFL guy that was afraid of getting busted for pot, he had that you know it's like a strap on urinator. <laughs> you, you don't know the uh, wizenator, wizenator. You don't know the wizenator. No, this no. Is, so and and you can buy it. It's this is a true story. You, I'd go online and buy it. The wizenator. So you buy it and it, you match the skin color. So if you're white, you you buy a white because you have to assume somebody's looking at right. your junk. So you buy a white. I would buy a white wizenator, and then you can buy different sizes. So this is a true story. So I would have really? to buy a really no, I mean, serious, dead, dead serious. And we it don't goes, have to look right and, now. And it goes over your junk. It, it, it goes under your. Yes, it's we'll look it up. And for you guys at home, you can Google Wizenator. Well, if you're worried about your drug test at, at work next week, it's probably Wizenator.com. Oh, That's our first ad ever on the forward <laughs> for the Wizenator. We've never had an ad. Um, so everybody wants to know. Where is Gregory now? And well, well uh, you know, I don't, I you know. don't know where he is. Um, as you see from statements uh, that Jim Walden mm -hmm. 
uh, his lawyer has put forward is that he's uh, in a secret uh, location with uh, with a lot of security. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I don't know if he's in this country. Because um, witness protection doesn't mean that you're in the United States. You could be in Honduras or in That's right. And, and, and technically, he was, he was in protective custody, uh, which is, you know, our, our, our government was deciding whether or not to, you know, charge him with crimes at, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the investigation, which, of course, that hasn't happened. Um, there was talk of that. There was talk of that at one point. Um, but, you know, of course, he came forward as a whistleblower. He's been working with, you know, the IOC, with WADA, with FIFA, with uh, U.S. authorities to provide information and, and the evidence that he has. Uh, and, you know, he's been fully cooperative mm -hmm. and him coming forward was part of him, you know, to share all of this information. Um, but I don't I don't know where he is. And um, I hope you don't. No, and I it's, wouldn't and it, know. Yeah, and, and it's certainly in incredibly concerning when you read the statements that his lawyer, Jim Walden, has put forward. Um, you know, he has said how the IOC, the Olympics, have done nothing to help protect him. Um, and they haven't even called on Russia to basically stop uh, their criminal charges against him, stop their efforts of retaliation, stop basically trying to hunt him. And when you see it, what's at stake right now is what we know is that everything that Gregory's put forward basically is proven as true. Mm. And then it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And even though the Olympics did not want to do anything, they finally had to do something because the evidence and information was so overwhelming and Gregory's legal team pushed so hard basically after the release of the film um, to which Thomas Bach, here he was a couple months after Icarus had come out, stating that he still hadn't seen the film, which we knew was not true at all. <laughs> of course he had seen the film. Yeah. I mean, we had received four letters from him, but to acknowledge the film would be to acknowledge the fraud, would be yeah. to acknowledge that they had to do something. So they did everything in their power not to do anything. And it wasn't through the constant, basically, um, attacks in the media and the press uh, through what had come through through the film and Gregory and his legal team working to push the story forward that the IOC finally had to launch their own investigation, finally had to talk to Gregory, and then in their findings um, corroborated everything that Richard McLaren had put out an entire year before um, and a year and a half before if you count in what he did for, for the Rio Olympics. And in so doing, they decide to ban the Russian team, but the ban um, is very convoluted um, as there's all sorts of loopholes in the ban. Right. And basically 200 Russian athletes are gonna be appealing to go to these Olympic games and are, appeal and are appealing their bans in the court of arbitration for sport. And so if Gregory is not available to provide this evidence, then these cases go away and that is the concern of his legal team as Russia is actively hunting him and the IOC and FIFA mm -hmm. and WADA have done nothing to actually protect the whistleblower, the right. man so who has brought let's, these let's truths Let's jam forward. on that for a second because, you know, I, I have a long history with, with those people. And so I want to be careful and try to be objective on this. But I can tell you one thing, Brian. If Gregory was a Bolivian, they would take action. But there's something there, and you you did a, I don't know if you were trying to to highlight this, but but the relationship between Bach and Putin and Bach and the Russians and Bach and soccer. I mean, he's he's not gonna he isn't gonna do that. He's afraid of them. He's their lapdog in many ways, right? That's right. He he might if 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 it was the Americans, he'd probably uh, do the same thing, but. If you get anywhere below that, the Bolivians, the Brazilians, the Belgians. Oh, they not only would have they been banned, they would have been banned from Rio. They would have had lifetime bans. They would have been banned from the next two Olympic yeah. Games. They would have made scapegoats. They would have turned this whole thing into, look how strong the Olympics stand for their Olympic values. And what you see and what is so uh, abhorrent in, in, 
in, in box action is you literally see him at those Sochi games going, play fair, be true, yeah. respect the Olympic values. Yeah. Then he's handed all of this staggering evidence on the eve of the Rio games, and he goes, um, this isn't for the Olympics to deal with. We'll pass it on to the sporting yeah. federations. And even now in his ban, his ban is is basically like putting a, a band aid on a on a on a foot long knife wound. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's in many a, ways it, that's a bigger story than than you know, th that level of collusion at at, at, at at the highest level, that is a that is a huge story. I mean that's in a you know it, it, it that story does not get told. I mean, we're talking about it. Well, yeah, and, and, here, and here the World Cup is being hosted in Russia this summer, and FIFA has refused to talk to Gregory. And if you read all the stuff and back and forth, FIFA and the IOC, they're all blaming each other and that Gregory wasn't available to be, to be, to, to be interviewed. None of this is true. Mm -hmm. And Jim Walden, Gregory's lawyers, come out on a number of occasions going, we weren't contacted, and not only that, we have continued to ask FIFA and the IOC to sit down with Gregory, and they're sitting there going, oh, we didn't have access to him. He wasn't made available. We couldn't talk to him. And now apparently FIFA is finally going to start uh, their own investigation, and who knows where that will lead. But um, there has been a complete lack of interest from these organizations to actually take any sort of meaningful action against a fraud that is a 40-year fraud on a level that is unimaginable in its scale. I mean, Bach, you know, if, if, his, if his chief of staff walked in and said, Mr. Bach, we have, we have a major doping conspiracy controversy about to come out. I mean, I can just see the wheels turning going, oh, God. Please don't be the Russians or the Americans. Just, just be the, just be the Guatemalans, please. But, oh yeah. But it wasn't. At one point in the movie, uh, this this quote, like, I didn't catch it the first time I watched the movie. I caught it today when I watched it the second time. Um, Gregory says to you, he says, "Wada is willing to pay anything for you and me to disappear because we will destroy their future and we will destroy their past." And I, again, I missed it the first time. When I heard it today, I was like, holy shit. Like, what? I mean, yeah. what's behind that? Well, when, when you look at it. And, no, and, I you know, know it. And, 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 you know, Gregory in the film, you know, he makes these outlandish kind of statements like that. And then you go, wait, this is, this is real and this is true. Because in the release of this evidence and the release of this story, it completely destroys Wada Pass because it shows that they have been completely ineffective in their entire history at essentially catching anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially in catching anyone through the methodology that they set forward. And you have to remember that WADA is only really a watchdog agency. They don't have any power to actually do anything other than to observe and report. So in that statement, he basically shows that not only was this conspiracy in place for basically all of modern sport history, but that, but that the Russian athletes were not testing positive. Mm -hmm. They were evading the system, and, and it shows WADA to be completely ineffective to do anything. And not only that, they sat on evidence of a Russian state-sponsored doping program for four years before doing anything, um, as Jack Stevenson wrote in his op-ed to the New York Times uh, last week. So you have that. And then when you look at destroying their future, I think what he is saying is, again, you have an agency that has no power to actually take punishment. They really don't have any power to, to do anything other than to observe and report. And again, you sit there and go, well, how are you going to win this war when there are so many variables involved and when a government can actually oversee the cheating of their athletes? And so to me, that is, that is the statement that, he's, that he is making. Right. But we're not talking about some sort of a. It just ca it came off a little, which, is, which would be hard to imagine that Wada has this idea to to take care of some people. But you know, I've I've and I get I've crossed that. I've gotten in trouble saying you know here you, the, the globally right the the global anti-doping fight costs 
hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And so, and then you know uh, how many people they catch, um, and it's it's less than one percent. Less than one percent. And and you know, and the the agencies hate it when anybody says that. And yet the estimates are twenty to forty percent. Well, there's been stuff. You know, there was the anonymous study in track and field where the fact that these athletes trusted this study is mind boggling, but they did an anonymous study and it came back, you're right, somewhere between 20 and 40%. So you've got this delta of 19 to 39% for hundreds of millions of dollars. You, you have to ask, but you know, this is the Brian, this is what they do when, when people start to question their efficacy, then, uh, and we had this, we had this discussion on the, on the call the other day with your team, my story, Russia's story, they're no different. These are opportunities for them to impanel McLaren and Pound and all these guys to investigate. Uh, that's no different than my story. And then they hold that press conference. They say, this is the most, they say, <laughs> they say the same thing every time. This, no, no, no. Now this is the most sophisticated thing we've ever seen. Like we were dudes like rolling around and like chitty chitty bang bang. I mean, it wasn't that sophisticated, but that's their moment where they can say, and I'm not, I'm not picking a side here. I'm just, I'm reporting it. I think exactly as it goes, that's their moment where they say, aha, we got it. We got them. We're powerful. We're going to protect the rights of clean athletes. But do you believe that? Um, look, so, so go back to, look, I, th I think they've gotten better. I, I think they've gotten, I don't know that the science has gotten better. I, I think, the, the most important difference that they made was what they call the whereabouts system, right? right. So in my day, I, I did pass 500 drug tests because you had a drug EPO that has a very short half-life, you know exactly how much you took, you know exactly when it'd be out of your system, and you knew when you were supposed to be available to be tested. The whereabouts now, when they can come to your gym, they can come to your house, they can come to the race, they can come to the hotel, they can come anywhere. You have to give them one hour a day where you know you'll be. Um, you know, that's, that's helped them, right? And so when I first started racing, they just tested at the races. So it is easy to pass that test. Uh, I don't think the science has caught up. Um, w again, it's very difficult. But how do you enforce the whereabouts program on a global level? I mean, you're an athlete in Kenya. You're an athlete in Russia. And what... And of course, what they were doing with in Russia, well, I can tell you know with I, the whereabouts program is is the doping control officers themselves were part of the conspiracy. I don't care where you are. Everybody has one of these. What's your phone number? You don't have to, you don't have to have your your find my friends turned on so they know exactly where. But it the thing I mean there are places in the world where there's no service, but it's getting less and less. But yeah, but what I'm saying is that, that okay, the Russians are on the whereabouts program, mm -hmm. okay? But the Russian doping control officers who are there to take their urine are literally there as, as the Russians would take their, a clean frozen sample out of their freezer and hand it to the doping control yeah, officer. That's a, you know, that's a whole nother deal. I mean, that you can't. Right. So if, if you want to be, look, you're talking about Russians and Russians. The last five years have been the last five years of my life, not because of Russians and not because of French. And you know, everybody thought during those those seven years, oh, the French are going to get him. The French are going to get him. The French are going to get him. Uh, uh, it was the Americans. So that that might happen in some other countries. I don't know, but it happened in this country. And I'm not I'm not whining or complaining. I'm just telling you that's exactly what happened. And so that is. Uh, that is a very, that is a completely opposite scenario. It's just a different mindset. Completely different. <laughs> completely different. Oh, uh, what else was I going to ask you? When we talk about Gregory and where he is, you don't know. I don't know. Nobody's supposed to know. Um, we don't know because they want him dead. I mean, there's talk that he's he's the most. I guess in America we have the you know the most the t top ten most wanted you know they're yeah. in the in the post office and everything. I mean he's the he's the most wanted man in Russia. That's what we've been told. That is, I mean think about that. There's so many crazy people out there. Even in Ru I mean there must be some crazy ass Russians, done some terrible stuff. And so, 
they want him. He's alive, so far as we know. Yeah. But two of his buddies are not alive. That's right. And so that's why I, I think the listener and the watch, the viewer, and when you guys watch the film, you guys talk about you talk about Nikita uh, Kamayev, Kamayev, the, who's you know perfectly healthy his whole life, goes out for a jog, boom, falls over. Essentially, yes. Essentially. After after talking to David Walsh. At, <laughs> I did. I, you know what? I did know that. And uh, yeah, so See, we didn't, you should never talk to David Walsh. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm <laughs> kidding. That's, 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 we may edit that out. We may not. Yeah. I don't know. You end up with a book or end up dead, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, but and then, uh, and then there was a second fellow, uh, Vacheslav Sinov. And in the case of in the case of Kamayev, um, and you know, and and again in in the film, you know, you see Gregory as this very likable kind of as you say, childlike character. And so you're going, wait, is, is this real? Is this, is this really real? Can I stop you for one yeah. second? Because when you first start talking, you're like, oh, you have dog. Yeah. He goes, you have dog? Yeah. He, and he says something like, girl, boy, he has balls? He has balls? And you're like holding the dog up. Like, yeah, there's his balls. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I see the balls. Like, that is crazy. Like, that is a likable. Uh, and you love him. Love him. And you, you love How can him. you not love and that? You, and you love this guy because he is just lovable. And to Who know him is to love this yeah. guy. Okay, sorry. And, and, I had to get and, the ball story there. And, and so as this story is unfolding, um, there's, that, there's that line between knowing him and then going, wait, this is, this is really real and this is really scary. And when Kameyov, um died of a heart attack at age 52, and the quick backstory of that is Gregory was in Los Angeles. This was um, February of 2016 now. And him and Kameyev had been keeping in daily contact through through WhatsApp and through Skype. Mm -hmm. And he was also very close. The, the, the two couples, his wife and Gregory's wife, they, they were all very, very close. And, and he had known Kameyev his, his whole life. And so Kameyev is running Rusada, which is the Russian anti-doping agency. But the Russian anti-doping agency is actually working with Gregory's WADA laboratory. So this should have never been happening, as you know, meaning the laboratory is in cahoots with the anti-doping agency to let them know when there's a dirty sample, when they collect the athlete sample, what's coming in, et cetera. And so Kameyev has a ton of information, but he didn't know the intricacies of the urine swapping operation because that part was separate. But he knew, of course, that he was collecting clean, dirty urine, that athletes were giving, you know, frozen samples to the officers, mm -hmm. et cetera. And that was all part of it. So Kameyev has now resigned from his post at Rusada. Gregory has resigned as the laboratory director in the fallout of this November 2015 WADA report. Yep. And Kameyev now has a bone to pick because he realizes that he's being pushed under the bus just like Gregory is. And Putin has come out on state television saying that the individuals responsible for this will be held accountable and punishment is absolute. And Kameyev is going, wait, wait, wait. I was just part of the system. I was acting on your orders, mm -hmm. right? So he starts corresponding to David Walsh. And the two of them make a plan that they're going to meet. Kameyev talks to Gregory the night before his death. And he says, yeah, I've been talking to David Walsh. I'm writing a book and we're getting ready to meet. And Gregory said, what are you doing? What are you doing, Nikita? You're, you're in Russia, you're in Moscow. You, you can't be doing this, they're monitoring you. Hmm. And the next day he dies of a heart attack. And it wasn't just any heart attack, it was a three and a half hour heart attack. And Nikita's wife was on the phone to Gregory. They were at their dasha, their country home in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> as basically Nikita's dying for three and a half hours. <laughs> and that was, uh, uh, and that was when things got really, really real. Yeah, and, and you, and you, it's crazy how much you were around, or you guys were around Gregory, all the time. Because when he literally, when he got the news, y'all were there. And he, and he was so sad and upset. He had to walk outside and, and he just kept saying, no, no, no. I mean, you, you captured all of it. I mean, yeah, we, you know, what, what had happened is there was a period of time between him arriving to Los Angeles and us basically bringing him into uh, protective custody, July of 26. So November of 2015 to July of 2016, um, 
he's here and we understand as a film team myself my producer Dan Kogan um, my financiers everybody on the project uh, understands the gravity of what we're dealing with and we're in this kind of daily crisis management it wasn't really about making a movie at that point it was about we're in a crisis this has got serious ramifications yeah. and we have to plan this out very carefully or people are going to die and this information is not going to make it out to the world and part of that was just okay we're just going to have a camera everywhere and so we didn't know at that you know what we were filming if it was going to make it if it was going to be important it was just like yeah. okay we are in this crisis situation and we just had and we just had a camera there um, at all time and and it wasn't until I brought him into protective custody in July of 2016 that the creative filmmaking really began because we were now out of the crisis and we were able to look at all this footage and go okay how do we craft this um, into a riveting piece mm -hmm. of of cinema how yeah. do we turn this into the thriller that we just lived through uh, and make audiences engaged and feel on the edge of their seats as we have felt over yeah. these you know past essentially well you did you it know, several years I mean, to be from april 2015 i'm like this guy is a kook get me out of this room to two weeks ago when i sat down i was like holy shit i cannot believe that's the same guy like i and even today in, in when you walked out to go somewhere mark and i were like that's a different guy like that dude you i don't know if people told you this or not but like just the way you you're just representing and I'm like that dude that's a different guy like this thing has changed your vibe your life your energy it's, it was I mean I'm glad you didn't end up being the kook that I met in April 2015 I'm glad I'm not glad for it because of certain parts of this story but it's it it's as the film evolved and and just to your energy it's just completely different it's mind-blowing well, thanks yeah. you know it, it's interesting because as you go through something like this mm. um, you know, it, it, it forces your evolution. And, you know, like when I sat down with you in in, in, in April of 2015, I was uh, a year on to this journey. Um, I was still very unsure of where it was going. And I was also in that state of, oh, my God, I'm going to go meet Lance. <laughs> and, you know, and so there was that there was that nervous apprehension there. And I remember sitting in that office and you're watching what what I put together and I'm over on the other side of the table and there's this surrealness yeah. to this that, that there's Lance watching uh, this this piece of footage that I wasn't I put checking together. my phone was I no okay good and then uh, uh, but you did recognize everybody in the in the footage and uh, well, of course. And, and and so to then you know essentially be here you know three years later um, as this whole journey is, has unfolded and it's all very real, I think, you know, changes, you know, who, who you are as, yeah. as you go through this process. Was it hard? It, it, Cause we're talking about that the, the, some moment, this, this thing took a quantum shift. This is not a film about you um, racing bikes. This no. is, this is a film about international mega drama, but you started a film wanting to make a film about you. Like right. it, it, at some point you had to be like, okay, wait a minute, just your own per and we all have this, our own ego. We're like, okay, this is, this is no longer going to be about me at all. It's going to be way, was that tough to like shift and say, okay, this isn't my movie anymore. This yeah, is it was, it, yeah, it, it was interesting because when the movie shifted, I had been filming f really for two years. And part of that two years is I had been doing my own investigative research. So I was behind the scenes interviewing Richard McLaren. I was interviewing Dick Pound. I was interviewing Olivier Raban at WADA and David Howman and Nigley. And then I had interviewed like 40, 50 other guys from Tyler Hamilton to, uh, to, yeah, to, to Timmy Dugan to, uh, to Tim Layton at Sports Illustrated. And the list goes on and on and on. So I was working on that you know uh, what was that initial film but also was was investigating but i still felt that that my journey through the film was 
was the was the core that I was essentially the protagonist and that I and that you know and that the film was ultimately about my journey and when it took a pivot and it was and Gregory arrives to LA in November 2015 after about two days of him being here I had a you know a kind of a, a come to Jesus moment where I said wait um, basically everything I've shot over the last two years doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> and, I agree. and, 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 and even though in my mind at that time, I would thought that we were in editing and that the movie was essentially over. It was like, Oh no, no, no. Wow. The movie is actually just beginning. And I had to go back to all of my financiers and my producing partners. And I was incredibly blessed because this team understood it. They saw it and Dan Kogan and impact partners. They went, okay, okay, we get this. And then not only did they come on for the ride, but we truly formed a team of how to, uh, every day, how to, how to make this progress in, in a meaningful fashion. And part of that through that journey was, was on the filmmaking side, being able to discard and throw away all of your notions of what you thought your film was going to be. And, you know, and, and it ended up in the final cut of now the film takes this pivot away from my story about 40 minutes into the film and in that first 40 minutes even 20 minutes of that is interlaced with clues and your journey yeah. and archival footage basically to get us to the pivot um, and so all of that stuff that I had shot all ended up on the cutting room floor because the movie that I thought I was making turned out <laughs> but to be not only not that movie, but I essentially started on a completely different movie two years into making the mm -hmm. first movie. Yeah, it, it, it's epic. It's epic. Uh, I, that word gets used all the time, and I'm just telling you folks, if you haven't seen this documentary, you have to see it. I don't want to be superstitious or weird, and but knock on wood, every you know Hollywood Reporter has it picked to win the Academy Award. Is that right? Or variety, one of the somebody has it picked, uh, the or the front runner. Yeah, both of them, one of them. No um, pressure. I uh, I don't like to. <laughs> Good. Let's not go yeah. there. Let's not go there. Yeah. And in fact, we can take it out if you'd like. Um, is and this is I can't even believe I'm gonna ask this. This let's end here, um, because when you watch the movie, at the end you're scared for Gregory. Yeah. And but the other thing I've I told you this personally. When I finished watching the movie, I was scared for you. And to be honest, I'm a little bit scared for me, just because you never know how all this stuff <laughs> works. Um, and I know you don't necessarily, or maybe you do feel scared, but I think you are you play it off with a certain sense of confidence. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think, and I don't know, you could speak to this maybe maybe uh, on, it, on a much more meaningful perspective, but... You know, to me, uh, feeling scared is riding my bike 100 kilometers an hour down a mountain pass in Europe with no guardrails on yeah. it, you know, when in the rain, when in, in the rain and that's going to be certain death. And I think that that, that is something that, that cycling and my journey as, as a cyclist through life has went, whoa, like if I'm able to do this, if I can do that, um, you know, and, and you go through life and you take these extraordinary risks. And so um, starting out on the journey and even what I was doing in those first two years, in my mind, was kind of an extraordinary risk in the sense that, you know, the, the dangers of the sport and what you put your body through. Um, and then the decision that we were going to continue on that story to tell the story, to me, felt more of a, of a moral and an ethical obligation. Mm -hmm. I had, I had this whistleblower, Gregory, come to me. He entrusted me with his story. His life was in my hands. And it was no question for me as to whether or not we were going to do whatever we had to do to bring this story forward because it was so much bigger than Gregory. It was so much bigger than myself and the team uh, and, the, and the film. But it affected world politics. It affected the planet. It affected all of sport history. It affected tens of thousands of clean athletes around the world for the past 40 years who never got to stand on that Olympic podium. 
because Russia had a state-sponsored doping program uh, seeing to it that, that their athletes were going to win, which to me is so far different than an individual athlete making a choice to dope because mm. this decision was coming at the hands of a government. Mm. And so when all of those factors played into it for myself, um, the fear for me went out the window because I felt that the story was so much larger than myself. And, um, and so I don't really worry about it too much. I just go, you know, you made this decision in life. I'm happy that I've made this decision. And I feel honored that I was able to, yeah. to tell Gregory's story and to, and to bring this story to the world. Well, he's your friend now. So this is a hard question. Uh, it, would, it would be a hard question for me to try to answer, and you don't have to answer it, but are they going to get him? You know... Because most people would say, look, whether it's the CIA or the KGB or whatever you want to call them. Look, the uh, reality is, is we're, we're living in this information age and technology age, and hiding becomes a very, very difficult yeah. thing. And, you know, just like what we saw years ago in that Will Smith movie, Enemy of the State, and what we see in all the Bourne films, et cetera, that's real. Yeah. And so, you know, there is intelligence operations going on on this planet that we keep getting information of, whether it's through WikiLeaks or, you know, et cetera, of things that governments have the ability to do, whether or not they can turn on your iPhone and turn it into a listening device or turn it into a camera. So I hope that they uh, will not get them. Um, because it sends a message which is which is the which would be the sadder part of that which is that telling the truth um, becomes a revolutionary act and it also becomes an act that you should be scared of and um, and I'm sure Russia would like to send that message mm -hmm. to their citizens that should they betray Russia this is the fate for you and so I hope that 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 the planet and the and the United States will continue to protect him and send that message back that this sort of behavior is not tolerable and that there is a price for telling the truth. Because so far, Gregory's price for telling the truth is basically to now live the rest of his life in isolation wow, and fear of death, which should not be his wife and daughter, the case. wife and kids are still in yeah. Moscow, no passport. They've they've cleaned out all his assets. They've. You know, no telling how rough they've been with them. I mean, this is all, I'm not speculating, this is all in the news. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, he may be in protection, but he, my sense is he's not on a beach, you know, uh, with his feet up, sipping a Mai Tai. At a, uh, all right, buddy. Good luck. We won't jinx it, but thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. I have one question for you. Okay. One question. I probably have an answer. So as, as, you, were, as you were watching this film and, yep. and seeing it unfold, and and in light of your own journey like what like what 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 were you thinking how did it like how did it make you feel in light in light of 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 your journey you know it, your it, history it it it's a great question and uh, everybody that and a lot of people and this, that was the tweet that i put out i ha literally had a thousand people say to me have you seen icarus and not all thousand said the second part but about 990 said this film is really good for you and i'm like what do you why and it, and it's it's it, it's just a sense of perspective right and 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 when my story and again i i might have watched this film at the perfect time if i would have seen this film not that it was out but if i would have seen it three years ago it wouldn't have been the right time for me to see it like i know my situation i know my life i know what's happened to me i know what i need to do I know how I need to act. Um, I, 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 I don't live with anger. It's, it's, it is what it is. But that took a long time to get to, that, to this place. And this place that I am literally right now is the time that I watched that film. And it really was just a logistical question of where to watch it. Um, but I'm glad that that didn't play into it because I wouldn't have been ready. Um, but when people talk about it, they, you know, Lance Armstrong, when, when my story went down, there were three headlines. This is the biggest fraud in the history of sport, who ran the most sophisticated doping program in the history of the world, and who forced young, impressionable men to put deadly substances into their body. Those, think about those three things. Those are terrible. You could say that about anybody. Uh, you could say that about the Pope, and you would, you would think he's a terrible person. 
And so, uh, you know, I think when people watch, if they still have that in the back of their mind, they watch this film, it, all of a sudden, the U.S. Postal Service cycling team just wasn't that bad. At least that's, you know, that's the feedback that I get from people. Um, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to minimize, not not so much what our team did, but what our, an entire generation of cyclists and cycling teams and directors and doctors and organize what, what that whole generation did. We can't minimize that, but it does get put into perspective when you watch Icarus. Yeah, I, f I feel like it certainly put, gets put into perspective yeah. in the sense of the larger, huge global well, system the tail on it for you place. guys for greg gregory i mean the tail on this thing is that's what but that's this that's what makes this story l live on today like we the movie's over the award season will be over you'll go on to your next project you'll go on a bike ride the tail on his story is forever and the real world events on this is forever yeah. because not only does it does it essentially change Olympic history for however many <laughs> years you want to go back. I think it calls into question the future um, as well. Mm. And, um, and Gregory certainly is never going to think be roaming uh, the streets as a free man, wow. uh, sadly. Yeah. All right, buddy. Thank man. you. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me here in New York. Awesome, awesome.